And therefore, we need to remember, revival is not determined by the political circumstance that the church finds itself in. Also, I think it's time for us as a church to sort of sound the alarm that evangelical spirituality has become a bit too politically rational. In other words, I think that political rationalism has begun to swallow up the transcendent nature of the Christian faith. All right, well, welcome to the program, everybody. My name is Emilio Ramos. It's good to be with you for another episode of Red Grace Media. Today, what I want to talk about is being heavenly minded or capitalizing on what just took place politically in our nation fresh on all of our minds is what happened to the red wave and what does that mean for us as believers who are called to have a very distinct worldview because as I see it when we look at what happens in politics too often Christians become so incredibly disturbed upset depressed angry And it really shows that for a lot of us, we are very, very much conditioned to think in a politically charged way where we are hyper invested in what happens in this world. And granted, though I understand that we are living in a world where politics really matter, and of course, the reason that matters is because we're dealing with worldview issues. And typically, obviously, as the evangelical church has always done, it has always supported conservative politics because with the rise of conservatism, let's say, there is also a rise in religious freedom, therefore securing the ability for the church to advance and propagate the gospel. And therefore, we should be invested in politics. However, We shouldn't be invested in politics to the degree that somehow our very identity or our entire worldview is actually affected by what happens politically in this world. And so today I want to talk a little bit about the the, the fact that there really was no red wave, but more importantly, I want to talk about the wisdom of pilgrim theology. And I think the reason we need to look at pilgrim theology is not just because I think it is the answer for the way that we interpret everything that happens in the culture, just in terms of, um, you know, in terms of uh, politics and how do we feel when elections don't go our way? How do we respond? What's our attitude? And But even beyond that, guys, when we're thinking about eschatology and the long view of things, uh, to understand that the Bible conveys a worldview to us that is essentially pilgrim-minded. And in that sense, we are called to be heavenly-minded. Now, that's something that I have talked about time and time again. It's something that over the years, I have taught over and over again. And of course, if you love biblical theology the way that I do, then you know that the very best of biblical theologians, Gerhardus Voss, Meredith Klein, G.K. Beale, Edmund Clowney, and many others, Richard Gaffin, Lane Tipton today, um, are teaching a very distinct eschatology that sets our minds on the heavenly kingdom of God to come, and therefore prepare us to think about things above, not about things concerning this earth, at least not to the point where we are consumed. Now, that is going to be in distinction to other worldviews or other, at least even theologies, other eschatologies that tend to view things a little bit different. Maybe if you're more on the post-millennial side of things, you tend to have a much more this-worldly kind of mentality that everything is about investing in this time, in this age, in, in, uh, in this period of church history uh, before Jesus returns, if you are premillennial, then your hope is similar to where where an amillennialist would be. But the difference there, of course, being that in the premillennial scheme, you're looking forward to a time where when the millennium comes, 
right? A literal future time of a thousand year reign of Christ, that that will be a partial answer to the problems of this age. But of course, in the premillennial scheme, it still doesn't do away with the problems of this age because that remains to happen at the end of the thousand years when we enter into the true eternal state. So a lot of eschatology kind of up front, but I feel like we have to do that uh, because we have to situate our pilgrim theology. I think, at least for me, it, it, it only makes sense or makes the most sense within that classic, historic, reformed, amillennial perspective. And hopefully that doesn't drive you away, but hopefully that intrigues you to find out exactly how do we get there. And then we're going to look at one passage of Scripture in depth uh, today, and hopefully you guys can follow along a little bit. Uh, In Hebrews chapter 11, Hebrews chapter 11 becomes the absolute crux interpretum. It becomes the the, the key passage to really understand this pilgrim theology uh, the right way. And so we need to talk about what is pilgrim theology, what is not pilgrim theology, and we need to look at the exegesis of Hebrews chapter 11 in considering what happens uh, to us in our worldview as it relates to things like politics, the direction of our nation, the outlook of our future, and those kinds of things. You know, in terms of the the outlook of our future, there are a lot of factors involved. There's the political aspect of this, but there's also the technological aspect of this, and something that I've been talking about for a long time. Uh, I feel like in out there in the evangelical world, and and even in the Reformed world, I, I feel kind of like a lone voice in the wilderness at times, because I definitely believe that transhumanist philosophy, or as Nick Bostrom has called it, a movement, um, that the transhumanist movement really is our future for the next five to ten years, uh, and that by 2030, uh, transhumanist ideas are going to really shake the world. Um, there, there will be exponential growths in technology tantamount to what we got when we got the smartphone. When we, when, when we all got the ability to do this and have a, a supercomputer, as it were, in the palm of our hands, that changed things. That made the culture different. That really accelerated us as a society, Where, uh, whereas before, you had to go get a clunky computer, but now you can put something in the palm of your hands and have instantaneous access to just uh, endless amounts of information, data, news. Uh, of course, with apps, what you're able to do now is just remarkable. And I think that the transhumanist agenda moving forward is going to introduce us to even more and more groundbreaking technology. It might happen slowly, but it will happen. And incrementally, we will see technology become incredibly intrusive into our lives. So I think it's important for us to see it both from the technological perspective and also from the political perspective as those things that are really shaping us moving into the future. If you think about politics, for example, um, yes, the sad thing is, is that when conservatism does not win or get the upper hand, especially nationally, especially as you think about presidential elections and what can result from that, then the world, it it seems as if it is already on a decided track and that moving forward, it is a globalist vision for the future that many places, especially in the West, are adopting. Now, I think it's going to ebb and flow. It's going to go up and down. I think church history kind of bears that out, that you will see kind of good and bad, good and bad. And I think that's the way the present evil age will be all the way leading up to the return of Christ, uh, where we will have uh, centuries where you'll see uh, Christianity being allowed to flourish. And at other times, you'll see various nations and states and the way that the culture and history develops where Christianity is simply more oppressed and persecuted and marginalized. I think we're in that right now, personally. Uh, I think we're seeing much more of a marginalized Christianity in our own day, especially as it pertains to the public square. But I think it's time for us to understand that when it comes to issues like politics and and the state of Christendom 
and the role of the church in relationship to the culture. And when you think about things like revival, to remember that revival is not conditioned upon politics, that just because you have political uh, circumstances and a political environment that doesn't seem to be favorable to the church, that is no certain sign that the church is not going to succeed or is not going to flourish in its mission. Matter of fact, it might be the absolute opposite of that. We may, in fact, flourish even more under hostile times. You think about what's going on in China and the fact that in China today, some uh, Christian sociologists who study demographics have told us that, in fact, it's possible that there are more Christians in China right now than there are in America. I mean, just think about that. And what are the political conditions in China? They're not good. The political conditions in China are such that the, the Christians in China would be begging for what's going on in leftist politics, <laughs> which would make things much more tolerable for them uh, in a communist state. And therefore, we need to remember, revival is not determined by the political circumstance that the church finds itself in. Also, I think it's time for us as a church to sort of sound the alarm that evangelical spirituality has become a bit too politically rational. In other words, I think that political rationalism has begun to swallow up the transcendent nature of the Christian faith that we used to, I don't say we used to, but you know what I mean, and maybe in larger scale, a more predominant worldview in the past. The things that you would find, for example, in Francis Schaeffer, that despite whatever the culture was doing, Christianity was going to flourish nevertheless. And that's because the Christian hope was settled not upon the political climate, not upon what's going on culturally, but what's going on biblically, so that we didn't look to politics to determine the state of our well-being and our spirituality as Christians. And therefore, I think that we have gone in many areas of the Christian church, we have gone from a gospel-centered zeal and for many people, they've become political zealots, where it's much more about what's happening with certain politicians, what they're tweeting out, what are the raging debates going on in politics today, and those kinds of things. Um, I tell you what, when you know a political uh, person or a, a president or a governor or, or what have you loses a race that seems to be more on the conservative side of things, it can completely ruin the day of your typical evangelical. And, and certainly it's sobering. And, and in fact, uh, like Jeremiah taught the people, right? Jeremiah's time when they went into captivity into Babylon, of course, the God had instructed the people to seek the good of the city because as the city flourished, they would flourish along with the city. And so it's not that we want to see bad transpire in the culture. Of course not. We want to see the culture uh, flourish because we want to flourish along with it. And so there are certain basic human rights. There are certain fundamental rights. There are certain religious rights, freedom of speech, and those kinds of things that belong much more at the common grace level uh, that enable the Christian church to simply experience more freedom and have more leverage in the culture to do its business of, of, of preaching the gospel and working in the kingdom of God. But at the same time, we never want to become so conditioned by the political climate that we lose the uniqueness of biblical Christianity. Now, remember, um, this is what Machen was teaching for when he, when he was fighting liberalism. He understood that Christianity was not a conversation that entered the fray. Uh, Christianity was not one worldview on the buffet of worldviews. 
that Christianity was not just one option on the on the table alongside of other philosophical competing worldviews. No, uh, because what happens at that point is that Christianity enters into some sort of ecumenical conversation where we are entering into what that's what I mean by political rationalism is that we enter into a conversation with people that have a completely different world view and a completely different starting point for that worldview than biblical Christianity. Of course, why is biblical Christianity unique, transcendent? Because it is rooted in the revelatory foundation of our faith. We have a faith that is built not on rationalism, not on empiricism, not on scientism. It is a faith that is built on the revelation of God, and therefore it is quite distinct and different from all the other worldviews that man can contrive in his vain imagination. I think that's what you have, for example, in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 18, all the way to the end of chapter 2. There, I think you're really looking at there um, at the most comprehensive uh, epistemological exposition of what Christianity is in contrast to competing worldviews that the Apostle Paul ultimately summarizes as either sukikos or pneumatikos. Either you are of the natural man or you are of the spiritual man. Either your worldview is rooted in the spirit or either your worldview is rooted in the flesh, is rooted in man's own nature and not in God's spirit. And of course, as a result of that, maybe working backwards, let's say going from second from 1 Corinthians chapter 2, uh, 14 to 17, back to chapter 1, verses 18 down to 21 or 22, where the Apostle Paul says, God has set aside the, the wisdom of the clever. God, you know, God's wisdom is folly to them, and through their own wisdom, they don't know God. They've never come to know God. And the implication, of course, is as, as the text just goes on and on and on, is that through unbelieving worldviews, the only thing that appears at that point, the only thing that obtains in the end is darkness, epistemic darkness, uh, spiritual darkness. And it's a remarkable parallel to what happens, for example, in Pauline theology elsewhere, Romans chapter 1, for example, Romans 1, verses 20 and following, where because man suppresses the truth of God, he is given over to epistemic darkness, and from epistemological darkness comes a particular kind of pagan worldview that issues forth in a total, uh, uh, in, in a total collapse of ethics and behavior, uh, and and therefore morality is dictated from the previous uh, commitment to a pagan cosmology. And I think that's what's going on today and why we have to continue to argue and fight for and to preserve a distinctly unique Christian worldview that is not in competition with the other worldviews of the world because so far as they are concerned, Christianity is really incomparable. There's nothing to compare it to. There is no other worldview that has for its foundation the ontological triune God of the Bible. I'm sorry, it's just you can you can have similar morals. You can believe that it's wrong to murder and steal and cheat and lie and all of that. But unless you have the ontological trinity at the back of that worldview, you really have nothing like biblical Christianity. So I think uh, that is absolutely important. So uh, today, though, as we think about the political uh, uh, you know, climate of what is going on in our country, and I know that right now midterm elections um, it's going to be a few days, probably possibly by the time this video comes out to know exactly how much damage was or was not done. But what I'm talking about today is kind of despite all of that, uh, because when we think about pilgrim theology, we are really talking about a theology that tells us to be prepared 
to let go of this world no matter what is going on in this world, whether Christianity is in a time of political advantage or whether Christianity is in a time of dire persecution. Pilgrim theology teaches us to let go. It teaches us that we ultimately don't belong here, that this earth in its present state, in its present uh, ontological condition is not our permanent home. And therefore, um, we need to we need to have a really good understanding of what pilgrim theology is and why pilgrim theology is so important as we compare it uh, even to other theologies. Um, now, let me just clarify something here. When we're thinking about pilgrim theology, Oftentimes, pilgrim theology can be associated with two-kingdom theology, and two-kingdom theology is basically a theology that has a particular understanding of protology, which is the, the garden situation in Eden, where in the protological order before the fall of man, okay, uh, how we understand the relationship of, of, of uh, nature and grace plays a lot into the way that we are going to understand concepts like common grace and special grace, and whether or not special grace has anything to say about common grace. Whereas in a two-kingdom philosophy, common grace becomes sort of a insulated, um, sort of a closed system of, of theology that is not informed by special grace, meaning the word of God. Um, where society is to be sort of preserved in a common grace fashion, and that common grace is almost undisturbed by what God does in special grace, and therefore we have two really hard and fast kingdoms, two hard and fast distinctions of the realm of common and the realm of special, so that in the end, the kingdom of this world and the kingdom of God have nothing to do with one another and in fact, we don't want any uh, uh, vestiges of the kingdom of God to intrude upon the common grace kingdom. I, I would differ from that, and I would probably take a more classic reformed position. That tends to be a bit more of a Lutheran uh, position to nature grace, but I would take more of a position that is uh, kind of historically Calvinist, where Calvinists would see much more of a, a, a special grace a, a revelatory intrusion into the common grace world, and that that intrusion into the common grace world is going to be the phenomenon of this world leading all the way up to the eschaton. Now, before we go too far with that line of thinking, it's also important to know that in that pilgrim theology, we are not talking about that the kingdom of God so intrudes, let's say, into the kingdom of this world that it takes it over or it dominates the kingdom of this world. That would be more of a theonomic thesis or a dominionist or a reconstructionist approach to church and culture, an approach that I think is just as false, maybe more so, than two-kingdom theology, because in Scripture, we are simply not promised any sort of geophysical dominion of this world prior to the return of Christ. Now, I know for a lot of folks out there, if you are sympathetic towards the theonomic thesis, you simply won't agree with that. And I will tell you that a lot of that has to do with your reading of the Old Testament versus my reading of the Old Testament, your understanding of the book of Isaiah, for example, versus my understanding of the book of Isaiah. I know some time ago, uh, when uh, when my little video that was floating around out there, uh, comments I made on Theonomy, made it to apologia, 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 whatever, I like apologia, but it doesn't sound as good, I guess, <laughs> on a website. But, uh, but when Jeff Durbin and apologia tackled my little video there, that, you know, one of the essential issues between us is going to be the way that we approach passages like Isaiah 2, Isaiah 11, Isaiah 9, and many other, Isaiah 65, our, 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 a 
assumptions relating to concepts like the new creation, uh, the new heavens and the new earth, the already not yet dynamic of biblical eschatology and redemptive history. We're going to have different concepts regarding those things. So anyway, I digress. I want to go back and say, yes, when we're thinking about pilgrim theology, there is a lot coming out of the two kingdom camp. And I think the two kingdom camp has a lot to offer us. There's a lot that we can benefit from, but I think ultimately um, we need something a bit more faithful to a a more evangelistic uh, kind of idea where uh, we advance the kingdom of God and expose the kingdom of darkness, and we don't simply appreciate it for what it is under common grace. I think that we need to be much more uh, countercultural than that. And, and But at the same time, pilgrim theology is also quite contra-theonomy, contra-postmillennial thought. And therefore, I think what is best is a pilgrim theology that is situated in a historic, reformed, amillennial theology that sees that the nature of the present age is still, in fact, what Paul says in Galatians chapter 1, verse 4, it is the present evil age. What Paul says in Ephesians chapter 2, when he talks about the course of this world, the spirit of the air, okay, uh, the, the, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience. And so um, one of the reasons I reject this idea that the present evil age, let's say, has ended is because... In Pauline theology, those two passages are parallel. Uh, you, you do any commentary, look at any critical commentary. They're going to take a, a Galatians chapter 1, verse 4, and they're going to take Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 and 2, and they're going to show that these are close parallels um, so that you, you have almost the exact same thing that, that, that takes place. In Galatians chapter 1, we are delivered out of the present evil age. In Ephesians chapter 2, it says, but, but God, <laughs> right? Uh, be in his mercy, right? He made us alive. And so again, we're delivered. And also in Colossians chapter one, uh, verses 12 and 13, uh, where there again, we are redeemed. He delivers us out of the dominion of darkness. And again, another parallel passage. So the present evil age is a way to talk about Uh, the sphere and dominion of sin and condemnation that is a principle governing this present world system and the condition of man under Adam. And that that is precisely what Jesus has come to do, to deliver us out of that present world condition, to deliver us out from under Adam's curse his his um you know when we think about adam the, i think the most helpful thing to think about is to think about things in terms of adam 1 adam 2 and adam 1 we inherit his guilt his corruption his pollution and his sentence of death and under adam 2 we get his righteousness attributed to us and therefore the hope of his resurrection the hope of his life and his ascension, that becomes our hope as well, glorification. And therefore, what God is doing is he is redeeming for himself a new humanity in Adam 2, in Christ, so that the doctrine of union with Christ is ultimately Adamic. It's ultimately talking about how we have left Adam 1 and we've been put into Adam number 2. So, Pilgrim theology is critical at this juncture because it reminds us that those of us who have been delivered out of this world system, out of the world, as Jesus says, right? That the the world hates you because I chose you out of the world. Uh, What a remarkable statement. Um, There needs to be, I think, some balance with this theology, because again, I think statements like that, statements that Christ made, statements that the apostles made, they kind of lose their meaning in a sense. They lose their sense. If we don't take them in this strict uh, sort of 
two uh, two king uh, all millennial. I guess I would say a more reformed two kingdom theology, a more reformed pilgrim theology. Uh, because then what happens is at some point in time, those categories don't apply anymore. Because if the world no longer has that spiritually pejorative kind of connotation and no longer refers to the sphere of sin and death and misery uh, that is in, that is um, integral to the present evil age, then though that language tends to mean nothing. And so I think that I think at that point th- that has much that's much more problematic for the theonomic camp at that point. But before we go too much further, I also want to talk a little bit about uh, Hebrews chapter eleven uh, because I think if you look at the book of Hebrews, I think there Hebrews eleven specifically verses thirteen to sixteen. The author of Hebrews is going to give us a comprehensive statement, and I think the most marvelous statement of pilgrim theology that is transtestamental and is um, intracovenantal, if I can put it that way. In other words, it spans the testaments and it transcends the covenants and it affects all of God's elect people regardless of what dispensation or age you're in. And so real quick, let me just read this passage and you can follow along. But this is what Hebrews chapter 11. Now I'm looking at this in Logos and hopefully this will be something you can follow along. And it says this, all these died in faith. Who are all these? Well, all of these are going all the way back to everybody he mentioned earlier in chapter 11, which is uh, going to be Abel and Enoch and Noah and Abraham and Sarah. In other words, uh, all of God's people leading up to this point in time, they died in faith without receiving the promises. Now, what were the promises? This is an interesting uh, phenomenon in this passage because I would say it kind of forms a chiastic structure where it begins and ends with the same concept. Without receiving the promise is going to end the passage when it talks about the promise of what God has prepared for us, namely, if you look at verse 16 real quick, namely the city of God, a city for them. But anyway, he says, without receiving the promises, having seen them and having welcomed them from a distance and having confessed that they were strangers and exiles on the earth. Now, that I would say is absolutely essential for pilgrim theology. Notice what they did. They recognized that they were estranged in this world. And to me, man, that is so comforting uh, as a Christian that is trying to live out the Christian ethic in a world that completely rejects it. In other words, we're trying to live out this ethic of worshiping the true and living God, that we have the secret of the Lord, as it says in Psalm 25, that God is revealing his covenant faithfulness to us, that God has given us his covenant promises, and yet we live in a world that is so hostile to God that it makes it difficult for us to worship God in fullness and in peace. And therefore, uh, as part of these ancient patriarchs and saints, at the very root of their faith was a confession that they were strangers and exiles on the earth. Notice that language. They were not only estranged to this world, but they were also exiles. In other words, It was as if the world itself was a Babylonian captivity that forced them to take on the the, the role of a refugee, to take on the role of an alien, the role of an exile in a strange land. Consequently, if you know anything about the general epistles, going from Hebrews all the way uh, up to the book of Revelation to Jude, But if you look at the general epistles, and I would include the the apocalypse in terms of the parallel and the inter 
textual dimensions just between the general epistles. You've got commentators. Uh, if you get if you get any good commentary, like in a word biblical, like a technical commentary, whether it's word biblical, whether it's NICNT, whether it's NIGTC, if you get a good technical commentary on the general epistles, whether it's the book of James or Peter or Hebrews or Jude or John or whatever, they're going to show you how that these epistles formulate kind of a unit within the New Testament canon, and that there's an intertextual theology that where these epistles inform one another and parallel one another in various times. And that is so true for the book of uh, uh, Hebrews. You see echoes of the book of Hebrews, if I can put it that way, in First and Second Peter throughout tons of parallels that are very, very similar. And it's just a remarkable theology that emerges out of this body of literature in Scripture. And as a matter of fact, when you think about this pilgrim theology, First Peter repeatedly talks about a pilgrim mindset. He appeals to us as pilgrims, does he not? He speaks to us as those that are pilgrims in this world, those that are Aliens. I mean, that's what the whole language uh, here in First uh, uh, Peter chapter one verses thirteen uh, to sixteen. We are told to fix our hope completely on the revelation of Jesus Christ. In other words, that we are going to that we should uh, fix our hope completely on what is coming to us eschatologically in Christ. And also, he tells us that we would that we would conduct ourselves in a holy manner in all of our behavior. Verse 17, that we would conduct ourselves in fear during the time of your stay on the earth. I mean, that language right there, the time of your stay on the earth is pilgrim theology to make it more explicit. First Peter chapter 2, verse 11, Beloved, I urge you as aliens and strangers to abstain from fleshly lusts. So in other words, it's a perfect parallel to what you have right here in the book of Hebrews. Now, if you go back to Hebrews, uh, the author of Hebrews keeps going. He says, for those who say these things, namely that they are strangers and exiles on the earth, just really quickly, is that what characterizes your identity? And at this point, this is where I would have more agreement with a two-kingdom theology than a theonomy theology, because theonomists have such a this-worldly state of mind, because, of course, they believe that they have uh, taken up the task of dominionism, and that they will convert this world into a Christian theocracy, what they call a Christocracy. And therefore, I find myself in much more agreement with anyone who would say, no, whether it's a premillennialist, whether it's a two-kingdom theology amillennialist, or what have you, I would have much more agreement with someone that says, no, I confess, I don't belong here. I'm a stranger here. I confess I'm an alien. I'm an exile in this world. I'm a pilgrim. I'm a refugee. I'm I'm just a I'm just a pilgrim who is sojourning through a strange world. And um and and and, and as the author here says, those who say such things make it clear that they are seeking a country of their own. Now, again, the confession of being a stranger and an exile, not only is it completely liberating in light of the many heartaches and disappointments that you're going to get in this world, whether it's political, whether it has to do with your health, whether it has to do with your finances, whether it has to do with church and ministry, friendships, uh, family, child rearing, or the lack thereof, you're going to have instances in this world in which this world will remind you you don't belong here 
and that really in your deepest identity as a Christian, Philippians chapter 3, verse 19 and 20, your citizenship is somewhere else. And so remember that, Christian, when the next election cycle blows in, (laughs) whether it's a presidential election cycle, whether it's a, a midterm election or what have you, or whether something develops on a global scale, that have you made the great confession? (laughs) Have you confessed yourself to be a pilgrim in this world? Uh, If not, uh, in my opinion, what's going to happen, guys, is that you're going to be far too invested in this world. You're you're, going to be far too invested and you're going to be like a roller coaster up and down as you look at what's happening in this present evil age. And the more you invest yourself there because you can't stop consuming what's coming here, namely the tweets, the headlines, the Facebook messages, the notifications, you know, what's happening in the media. And, as, and the more that you're sucked into that narrative you will forget the great the greater narrative of biblical theology you will forget the greater narrative of biblical eschatology and you will forget the greater narrative of pilgrim theology and a heavenly mindset and you will therefore be walking in a way that will show that you are in fact not confessing <laughs> that you're a stranger and an exile in this world. And I will tell you, it, I don't, it doesn't matter how zealous you are for you know, uh, taking the culture over, <laughs> you will be doing something that is quite unnatural to the Christian life because you will be doing something quite contrary to this great patriarchal confession. Now, remember, uh, this is the author of Hebrews who will end the chapter by saying, we will be perfected with them. And so their hope, in the let's say the Old Covenant, Old Testament, and going all the way through redemptive history, all the way back to Abel, their hope is our hope. Their future is our future. Their eschatology is our eschatology. Their country is our country. Their home is our home. That's the point of it all. But here's the real question now. Is their confession your confession? Is their confession to be pilgrims, is that your confession? To be a pilgrim and a stranger in this world. He says, when you make that confession, you make it very, very clear that you are seeking a country of their own, that they were seeking a country of their own. In other words, that you are seeking a home that you have yet to obtain and that this place right here is not it. You were made for something else. You were elect for something else. You were created for something else. The kingdom of God is already and not yet because... Though you participate in it right now, spiritually, you're participating in it right now because of your union with Jesus Christ, but it is also not yet because the kingdom of God, as much as it is a present reality at the spiritual mystical level through union with Christ, and yet it is an eschatological future reality that is awaiting its consummate form In the future, we are seeking a country of our own. Verse 15, he goes on. And if indeed they were thinking of that country from which they went out, they would have had opportunity to return. Now here, the author of Hebrews unmistakably is eliminating the interpretation that says they were thinking about, let's say, the land of Canaan, or they were thinking of Mesopotamia, or they were thinking of some other land or country or, you know, uh, a nation that they could have returned to. But of course, they had that opportunity. They could have easily migrated back to their home countries, but they did not. They did not. Why? It says here, strong adversative, but 
He says here, but as it is, they desire, uh, they desire here a better country. Now I have the Greek text right here, I guess just because this is the way that my workflow is on Lagos. But at any rate, this passage is just so crystal clear, right? They desire a better, and of course the kraton there, better, that Greek word there is replete throughout the book of Hebrews. So this fits the entire theology of the book of Hebrews of a better priesthood, of a better sacrifice, of a better offering, all of these things, better promises. And watch this now, a better country or here uh, just that they desire something better or a better one or something like that. Uh, literally, there's no, the word country is not here uh, in this uh, in this translation, but they just desire the better, we can say. And then to make it crystal clear, moving away from the metaphor and getting to the actual reality of what the author of Hebrews is talking about, unmistakably now, he talks about heaven. What do they desire? What did the patriarchs really desire? They desired heaven. They desire a heavenly country. And Uranus here is uh, unmistakable. Um, they desire a heavenly place. <laughs> they desire a heavenly realm, a heavenly country. They want a heavenly residence. And therefore, they were created for this very purpose, to go to heaven. I mean, uh, you know, biblical theology is one of the most glorious theologies that you can study. Biblical theology is deep and profound you read Gerhardus Voss, you read G.K. Beale, you read Meredith Klein, you read Edmund Clowney, and you should. If you have not yet read one volume on biblical theology, I would encourage you to begin with Edmund Clowney, The Unfolding Mystery. Read that book first, fall in love with Reformed biblical theology, and then move on to deeper waters. Um, if you want just straightforward exegesis, then read uh, G.K. Beale. Uh, read G.K. Beale's New Testament biblical theology. Uh, read his biblical theology on the temple. Read G.K. Beale's uh, book, uh, God Dwells Among Us, Eden to the Ends of the Earth. Read that book. Um, just incredible. But here it's unmistakable, if you just look at the text, that heaven is the objective of pilgrim theology. It's not just a perpetual existence in this world. Neither is it some sort of cultural reconstructionist vision. It is an eschatological vision, unashamed. Remember, remember, we make the confession. This is something we confess. We make it clear. We're seeking a better country, a country of our own. And this country is not found in this world. Verse 15 but instead, it is a better country. You see that? It is something that is, that, that is far beyond. It is a country that is, we could call it a supra country. It is a supernal country, a country that is characterized above everything by heaven. He goes on. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God. Isn't that remarkable? What a sweet, wonderful word. God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. That is telling us everything about pilgrim theology. And when you examine exactly the contents of this verse, verse 16, in verse 16, you have in one verse, not just the summary of the entire argument in chapter 11 up to this point, but in a sense, you have an argument here. You have a summation. You have a bite-sized passage that sums up very succinctly, the summation of the book of Hebrews. You have, in a sense, in verse 16, you have a very simple, beautiful, eloquent statement 
that summarizes biblical eschatology as a whole. Now, let's talk about this city. God has prepared a city for them. What city is that? Well, we know, verse 15, it's not a city found in this world. And if it is a heavenly one, then this is none other than the city of God, the new Jerusalem, that will descend out of heaven and heavenize all of created existence. It is the consummate point of Armageddon where the world comes not only into judgment, but comes into new creation. A, the cosmic point of total covenant consummation and cosmic renewal. And the author of Hebrews has just told us this city is not a city you're going to find anywhere here. And to make that point crystal clear, the author of Hebrews, of course, will go on to say later in chapter 13, he's going to go on to remind us again of this very pilgrim theology. Let's read here. He says, therefore, Jesus also, that he might be sanctified, that he might sanctify the people through his own blood, he suffered outside the gate. So let us go out to him outside the camp, bearing his reproach. No longer are we thinking about theocratic Israel, of course, new covenant. No longer are we thinking about a theocratic uh, priesthood or sacrificial system because they've all been not just fulfilled by Christ, but replaced, completely replaced and surpassed, replaced and surpassed. He says, for Therefore, this going out, going out to him outside the camp, therefore, literally means that we have to go outside this world camp, outside this world, by identifying with him, identifying with his sacrifice. And as a reminder that that is what he's talking about, the author of Hebrews says, for, here's the explanatory clause, for, We do not have a lasting city here, or for here, we do not have a lasting city. That's really, really amazing because it it captures perfectly how that we cannot ever hope to put our faith in a temporal city, which means, brothers and sisters, We cannot put our hope in a temporal political system either. We cannot put our hope in a temporal world. And therefore, the author of Hebrews goes on to say that they are seeking the city which is to come. They are seeking that which is to come. And and that makes perfect sense uh, because... He even says here uh, that what they're seeking is that which is coming, right? Because uh, here the uh, participle is substantival. So what that means here is that uh, he doesn't actually use polis again. Uh, Polis is used earlier that we don't have a lasting city. The antithetical parallel is then found in the substantival participle. We are seeking uh, we are seeking the one to come, literally, or the coming one. Remarkable. And so what this is telling us is that where our passion should be placed is not in the cities of man here, but in the city of God, in the city to come, in the city of the living God, which is the new Jerusalem that will be unveiled at the end of the age. I hope that you have found uh, this just little bit of pilgrim theology helpful, even as we are all experiencing political frustration with a a, a, a temporal city that won't last, <laughs> that cannot deliver, and that will never produce for us the kind of hope, the lasting dreams, 
the kind of human flourishing, the ideal life that we all seek for ourselves and our families, we will never realize that here. Because in seeking that sort of ideal life in a present temporal city is to seek something God has never promised to realize in this age. Therefore, like the author of Hebrews and like the people in the book of Hebrews, the, the, the audience of Hebrews, set our mind, set our heart, and pursue, seek after the city which is to come. And so I hope that you find, found that encouraging. Uh, until next time, be sure and share the video, subscribe to the channel. Also, make sure and go to our podcast, Christ and Kingdom. Until next time, God bless you.